Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France Benguet debate on a day when the opposition is in the streets in uh, Venezuela. Things have uh, gotten dramatic in the past week with uh, first uh, the Electoral Commission, uh, which uh, has uh, annulled plans to recall President Maduro. Then we saw Parliament trying to overrule that on Tuesday uh, with plans for a political impeachment style trial. Uh, as well, uh, President Maduro himself getting an endorsement for his part from uh, the military. We're talking about it all in the company of uh, Oswaldo Ramirez, Director of Risk Consultants, ORC, who joins us from Caracas. Welcome back as well to uh, Venezuelan journalist and photojournalist Sara Suarez, uh, writer Vincent Ulive, the author of Who Killed Simon Bolivar, and from Lubbock, Texas, Iñaki Sagarzazu of uh, Texas Tech University. Uh, speaking of uh, Texas, or the United States, if you will, President Maduro uh, bringing Washington into uh, the row over whether or not uh, the Vatican should broker talks. This uh, in a response to uh, opposition leader Enrique Capriles's objection to uh, those uh, church-sponsored uh, initiatives. And why do they refuse dialogue? Because over in North America, the outgoing government of Barack Obama has ordered to set Venezuela ablaze and to put an end to any dialogue. Uh, Iñaki Zagarzazu, what's your reaction to that? I mean, the, the Venezuelan government since uh, Chavez, uh, especially since the coup in 2002, has used the U.S. Um, as a scapegoat. Um, to for anything, um, I think that the I mean the rhetoric hasn't changed over the years, so I'm not really surprised that they're they're blaming the U.S. and saying the U.S. is meddling in Venezuelan business um, through the opposition. So not not really surprising. Just just a, a quick point though to what you were saying. You get the conversation before on the opposition. I agree that they're they're it's difficult that they're going to dialogue. They're, and the reason is because they don't trust the government, because the government has used the excuse of dialogue uh, in the past to just postpone things. Um, so I think that's the key, right? The key is finding that proper um, proper signs from the government. Uh, and I think that's what the opposition is going to demand with all these protests. Yeah, because uh, the uh, uh, this sort of political trial they want to start in parliament, how far can they get with that? With this, with this dialogue, no, with Sorry. with uh, with trying the recall through Parliament. Well, I mean, they really can't do anything. The 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 the, the Constitution does not um, allow for the impeachment, like in other countries. Um, they can just get um, assign political responsibility to the president. But with the other branches of government, uh, unless you see a break in the government uh, coalition, the opposition is not going to get anywhere. I mean, the the, the Supreme Court has consistently said that the opposition is basically void um, because it's not following their mandates, right? Um, and so it's the, the, what they're doing at the National Assembly is they're, they're just, it's basically for show in a way. They're trying to keep the forms, uh, but, but again, unless another branch of government is willing to step in and, and agree with the, with the opposition, not much is going to happen. Um, so that's probably that, that, it's also will send a signal to the international community that things are going uh, happening but but for the most part they haven't been able to to do much with it with the congress uh, vincent Levy, let me get your reaction as well to uh this call for a general strike uh, uh that's being reported uh, right. by, by by local media when you see the state right now of uh, venezuela's economy can there be a general strike well, again, I, I really don't know what you can achieve with that if that's not just putting pressure on the government uh, in order to, to foster some kind of change. But the, the, the gambit on the street and on the social protest has to change. I'm sure the people in the opposition are, are thinking about other ways of channeling uh, this rage and this anger because if not, it's going to petter out and then you're not going to have anything to go on with. Uh, and I'd just like to add uh, to what Iñaki was saying that, yes, the opposition is trying a little bit of 
legally sleight of hand in stretching the interpretation of Article 223, 233 of the Constitution and trying to say that Nicolas Maduro abandoned his post. That's their gambit, and it is a stretch of interpretation, but it is nothing compared to the trampling and outright trampling of the Constitution that has been done by the Chavistas in their interpretation and by which your constitutional right to have a recall referendum isn't really a, a constitutional right, that the right of the Amazonas people to be represented isn't really a constitutional right. So while the opposition is trying to stretch and interpret this in terms that would allow them to do out with Maduro, the government has really thrown the constitution out of the window in more than one occasion. So that's important to underline. I, excuse me, I believe that the, the opposition right now, what they have is the only possibility they have is to play in a, politi in a political territory, in the symbolic, in doing this kind of <laughs> strategies, the procedure of uh, the responsibility of the president, uh, in the breaking of the constitutional order and all these kind of, of steps, putting the people in the street, is, is the only territory they have right now, the political actions in order to make them feel their voice. In front, they have a government who have the control of everything. And these actions, these political actions are the only way they can get the support in a certain way of the international community. So I think that's the strategy they're using because it's the only thing they have. To All wear right. right now. All right. The 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 while the political fight uh, continues, the argument rages uh, over the real state of the economy, the rate of inflation, considered uh, the highest in the world by the International Monetary Fund. That figure disputed by some economists. For ordinary citizens, the impact is real. There are times when we have nothing to eat. We starve because we can't get anything. Sometimes my husband and I don't have money, and we spend all day without eating. If we eat, it's only a small piece of bread each, with water. Eleven thousand bolivares for this small bag of cookies, a little bit of milk, three bananas, a little bit of fish, a little bit of cheese, and a little bit of ham. Oswaldo Ramirez, 11,000 bolivars for that. Is that possible? Yes, it's that possible and a lot more. The, the inflation, the explicit inflation is about 900% just in food. Uh, if for see you figure it out, six of every 10 Venezuelans is not going to have three dinners on the plate, on the table every day. Right now, uh, about... 30 or 40 percent of the population has a lot uh, between five and 15 kilos per in the, in the past three four months uh, the inflation the high cost of living is a thing it's a real thing and for me it's the most important variable that's going to produce some some kind of rage some kind of of, of anger in the streets. I was going to say, because how can we have this sort of political holding pattern that we've been describing when you're telling us uh, 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 about this rate of inflation? Because people doesn't figure out how this inflation, how the high cost of living are impacting, are, are the consequences of the bad model, a failed model that starts in 1999. The people doesn't understand that 2017 is going to be worse than 2016. And the people doesn't figure out how the protests will lead, will conduct to a new model, or a new pro, a new model of public policy. And, and right now, unfortunately, uh, they don't connect the political protests with the high cost of living and inflation and the lack of, of services and the of security. Vincent Olivia, that's an important point because yes. uh, people, uh, saying, uh, first of all, touting the virtues of the fact that Hugo Chavez lifted a lot of people out of poverty. Uh, I believe at the um, at his peak, the uh, poverty rate went as low as 21 percent, according to a new study. Uh, right now, it's at 76 percent. That probably that, yes, that poverty but, but, rate. Uh, but the but the other point is, people also who've got a long enough memory say, oh, it wasn't any better when it was the opposition. <laughs> Well, I don't, I don't know about memories and stuff like that, but I can tell you that uh, people are not taking this sitting down. Only in the month of September of this year, we've had uh, 21 lootings. 
And that's twice as much as we had last year. And we had 33 attempted lootings in that month. So people are reacting to this. There was a uh, very strong image uh, when uh, sugar fell on the ground and people started trying to pick it up with their bare hands and put it in their pockets. And it was heartbreaking. So people are reacting in a, in a very, in a way that it is not organized. That's where the political institutions have to come in and the opposition and give that some form of organization and structure all this. And it has to be very quick in order to be able to put in plan a, a sequence of events. We're seeing live images there from Caracas uh, of, the, of the demonstrations. Uh, Sara Suarez, what's the situation in terms of what we're describing, the economic hardship outside of the capital? I think uh, I don't agree with uh, what uh, the colleague was saying, because I think the people understand perfectly well that next year is going to be worse than this year. Um, and inside the country, outside of Caracas, uh, people are, are suffering all sorts of shortage since very long time, even before it came to Caracas. People were trying to find food and find solutions and medicines and the situation with the hospitals has been terrible inside the country uh, longer before, before this crisis came to Caracas. Um, in, in the cities like uh, San Cristobal, which was one of the main places where in 2014 there were uh, demonstrations, uh, people are now trying to survive with the economy coming from Colombia and trying to buy some stuff. They have to make lines to cross the border and buy what they can put in a bag and come back. I mean, those kind of situations are very humiliating and, and people are tired of all that. I was, I was quoting these, these um, statistics on poverty. I'm pretty sure, although I didn't do it myself, that if you correlate it with uh, the price of oil, uh, it seemed that one curve seems to follow the other. How does Venezuela get out of that? Well, that's a question that if we could answer, we would not be getting to, <laughs> yeah, to just, this situation. If, if, I, if I may say one thing, if you correlate that to oil, Venezuela is the country that reduced poverty the least of all the oil producing uh, countries during the boom between 2002 and 2008. So we, were, we did lift people out of poverty, but we were the worst out of all the countries that did export oil. Iñaki Sagarzazu, it's obviously an age-old discussion, uh, the curse of oil. But in Venezuela's case, when you have mediation efforts, is this at all on the agenda? Oil? Um, I mean, I don't think so. I, I doubt that they'll um, they'll put that in the agenda of discussions of, between the negotiations. I mean, the, the Chavismo exacerbated a, a, an oil policy that, that came from the past, right? Um, so in that sense, um, there, I, I've heard different views of oil policy from from the opposition. And, and to be honest, um, the, the, the one criticism that the opposition has received constantly is that the, they're not providing much uh, clear um, views as to what are their policy preferences if they ever get to, to government, right? Um, I assume that right now, because we're in crisis, everyone is talking about changing our oil dependency. As soon as the barrel of oil goes up, as it always happens, um, everybody's going to forget that, right? And we're going to uh, once again ride the wave of and, oil. And oil has price. started to inch up. Uh, if uh, OPEC countries do succeed with Russia in uh, curbing uh, production and we see a sizable increase in the price of, of crude, does that save Nicolas Maduro's job? Well, that's what they're, they're aiming for, right? That's why they're postponing the, the, the regional elections for the, the um, sort of June uh, of next year, so the first semester of next year. That's why they want to postpone everything as much as possible uh, because they believe that inside the government, um, and, and not unrightly so, they believe that if they manage to get more money and to improve the situation, then the blowback won't be as bad. However, I think but what they're really managing is they're really managing to upset the majority of Venezuelans, even those that uh, at some point supported the government. Well, you, you need heaps of, of, of money. I mean, you need petrol to go up to, like my back of the envelope calculation, would, it would have to go back to 100. If it doesn't go back up to 100, then you're, but you're still in, the, in a deficit and you won't be able to climb out of the hole. That's how high it needs to go. Does, does... Well, I don't think they want to get out of the deficit. I just think they want to have <clears throat> money to distribute before the elections. Oh. Yeah, yeah the, the government needs $20 billion in the next year to put in the social expenditure to try to, to reconnect to the people. If they don't have 20, 20 15 billion at least, they, don't, they, they can't achieve that, that thing. And the electoral way, maybe it will be a way that, 
that will be truncated for the next year in 18 and 2019. Chavez had an emotional and a financial connection with the people. Maduro only had a financial connection with the people. This is the only thing that he can give to the people. And that's why they're, they're trying to hope for that good news of the oil coming up. But I think they made a, a very simple decision when they annulate the referendum. They decide, if we, don't have, the, if we have the referendum, we're going to lose it. If we annulate <coughs> that, we might have a revolution in the street but we can't control that. And that's what they decide to do. They prefer the people in the street. They prefer this political um, tension. Yeah, tension from the opposition. But um, that's what, that was the, better, the best card they could play in this, in this moment. One other point I want to bring up, but you talked about... So can I just quick say something? Go ahead, quickly. I think that just just to complete the idea, I think that the government basically rather pays the short term cost of holding the referendum um, in the in the hopes that the opposition will will sort of not be able to be coherent with the strategy, and so they can they can postpone things a little bit more um, till the next elections. I think they're just kind of buying time um, in, in this in this way. All right, uh, something that was mentioned by uh, Vincent Duleve earlier about. Uh, how uh, those on Maduro's side have the monopoly of power. But the question is about rule of law. Venezuela has not published official crime statistics since 2009. So um, it's by extra extrapolations, by monitoring groups, uh, most notably going to morgues, that uh, Caracas, according to one survey published by The Economist, is the world's murder capital. Of course, again, this is an estimate uh, Oswaldo Ramirez, how bad is it when it comes to homicide and crime? Well, uh, I think maybe th this thing is going to to increase. Unfortunately, those, the hunger, uh, the high cost of living are increasing, are pushing the crime, the violence, and a matter of fact, that there are a little, a, a bit of opacity in the murder rates, but the people right now knows that crime could be increased in the next three, four, six months because the people are going to the streets uh, for robbery to eat. How do you how do you reverse it if there if the state coffers are empty? What do you do? Sorry. What do you do when the state the state's uh, coffers are empty? How do you rev reverse this crime rate? You can you, the only thing you can reverse is the first thing you have to to make a major change in the public policy for security. The the first thing you have to to cut off the the peace zones. The the second thing you have to promote an internal change in the in the national police because uh, right now uh, seven of every ten policemen uh, are involved in corruption acts or, or are openly participating in, in, in the organized crime. And the other thing is you have to, to pay more, more money, more salaries, better salaries for those people that right now are, are working with, with hunger salaries. Sorry, sorry. Hunger salaries, but also the fact is that the government uh, destroyed the, the private industry. So you don't find a job in Venezuela. If you don't work for the government right. in a direct or indirect way, it's difficult to find a job. So when you destroy the private sector where people are going to find a work, uh, it's very difficult that the government and the state assume uh, that responsibility for everybody. I think you would need effectively, you would need to clean the security corps, the police uh, and, and the and the military sector to to professionalize them. And also you need to take away the guns that are in the street and you find them so easy that you just, with a couple of, of Bolivars, you can find a gun everywhere in, in the whole territory. So uh, you need to put away all the, those guns that are controlled by the military. So the question is, how did they get out of their control in the beginning? There is a certain way, a complicity maybe, that is working here in a very bad way and is putting all those guns in the hands of, of people who shouldn't have them. Uh, and just to, just to put things into perspective, uh, you were astonished about the 11,000 Bolivar bag of groceries. Well, a college professor makes about 14,000 per month and a cell phone costs about 500,000. 
So if you steal a cell phone, you're making 20 times the salary of a college professor. So that's a huge incentive to push people into crime instead of being a construction worker where you're barely going to make 22,000 and maybe 30 a month. Faced with this reality, Inyaki Sagarzazu, what should the international community be doing? <coughs> well, I mean, the, the, the international community should be, um, the, I mean, the, the OAS has a clear mechanism to deal with this type of situation. I think they should clearly uh, uh, call for the democratic charter to be applied in Venezuela. I think that there's plenty of evidence that the rule of law uh, and the constitution has been violated uh, to the point where we cannot call uh, Venezuela democracy anymore. And that's what the democratic charter is for. Um, so I, I think the OAS needs to be less uh, afraid to ruffle feathers uh, with uh, Venezuela and other leftist government in the region who are supporting it. Um, and clearly move up on the agenda, um, the, the, the democratic charter. Um, other than that, other than pressure from its peers, I don't think the international community can do much about Venezuela. Um, they should probably pressure as well through Zapatero, who seems to have a close relationship with Maduro. Um, but there's, there's not really much that international pressure can do, more than symbolic gestures, um, kind of that, that provides some sort of, um, uh, Feel good support for the opposition um, as it tries to reestablish. I mean, the opposition is just asking for elections to be held um, so that the will of the people can be heard, right? They're not asking for, for an overthrow of the government as they have asked in the past. Um, they're asking for the constitutional mechanisms to be followed. Um, and so I think the international community could and should support uh, the opposition um, in these uh, endeavors. Inyaki Sagarzazu, I want to thank you for joining us from Lubbock, Texas. I want to thank Oswaldo Ramirez in Caracas, Sarai Suarez, Vincent Ulive. Stay with us. Our Media Watch segment is next. And we say hello to uh, James Creedon. Hi, Francois. James, a barrage of bad news. So you've been peering at the Facebook page of Venezuela's president. Right. Uh, he's trying to put a positive spin on things. I suppose that's what you do uh, on uh, social media a lot of the time. Venezuela triumphs once again, uh, says uh, Nicolas Maduro, in the Bolivarian diplomacy and, and revolution. Now, he's talking about a, a lightning tour that he has just completed. And uh, the, our, after this tour, uh, the ties of uh, cooperation, solidarity and understanding have been strengthened, strengthened between Venezuela, Iran, uh, Qatar, Azerbaijan and Saudi Arabia. He talks about during that trip incorporating a visit to Pope Francis in the Vatican. So it was a tour for, for I suppose, petrol and energy, but also in, in incorporating spiritual energy. In any case, a very positive message coming from uh, Nicolas Maduro's uh, Facebook, which belies uh, headlines that we've been seeing in the world's press for the last number of weeks, perhaps simplifying uh, the crisis into sort of sound bites, but terrible stories talking about overcrowding in prisons, uh, uh, issue, you know, the, the bill, just the, the breakdown in many ways of the infrastructure and the ability to, I suppose, mm. uh, get things done. Corpses uh, in morgues apparently not being attended to, autopsies being a thing of the past. And then you have uh, those who have uh, the means, uh, according to this headline in the Financial Times, building their own oasis. So certainly if these are snapshots into what's happening in Venezuela, they're very disturbing snapshots. And no surprise then that you, that you see the protests that you're seeing on the streets uh, today. Now, the hashtag that we're seeing a lot of uh, federating, if you like, those on the streets is the taking of Venezuela, la toma de Venezuela. And uh, lots of images going online as well, showing, uh, uh, I suppose, bird's eye views of streets absolutely packed full of protesters. Uh, and that's not just in Caracas, but it's in towns and cities across the country. This uh, photo here taken in Barquisimeto in the Lara region in the north of Venezuela. Again, using that hashtag uh, Toma de Venezuela or the taking of Venezuela. And uh, the date is also being used to the 26th of October as uh, a hashtag uh, bringing together a lot of that comment. Now you have images also such as this one doing the rounds. Uh, Venezuela, uh, the street with no return, I suppose, in other words, taking to the street and not taking no for an answer. And uh, that's the hashtag on the top and the Venezuelan people all to, to, to the streets. Uh, so you also have um, uh, the hashtag, the taking of Caracas, I suppose more is focused on people in the capital. And uh, that was a video which seems to have gone offline now, but it was that was showing a, a huge gathering in 
Venezuelan capital. This is a panoramic image as well, uh, also from uh, the capital. So you can see massive crowds uh, certainly uh, taking uh, to the streets. Now, uh, to look at the uh, other side, I suppose, or those who are supporting uh, Nicolas Maduro, you have uh, the state... Uh, a broadcaster, uh, which is uh, being retweeted, in fact, by Nicolas Maduro. This is one tweet I found here, quoting uh, one of his ministers saying, the victory is in the street and in the people. So I suppose they're reappropriating the language of the protesters. And you have counter demonstrations as well. But what's interesting to note here, and we saw it in earlier protests a few weeks ago as well, is the shots taken by the state broadcaster tend to be tighter, um, focusing on... Uh, I suppose, more specific scenes as opposed to the vast panoramas uh, that uh, you are seeing of the opposition rallies. So that's indicative probably of an attempt to hide the fact that maybe there isn't quite as much enthusiasm as in the past for supporting uh, Nicolas Maduro. All right. Many thanks uh, for that, James Creed. Yeah, a bit of, we were talking about nostalgia for the days when Hugo Chavez talked about an odour of sulphur when he would go to, to the United Nations. Uh, I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France Vanguette debate.